This video itself, uh, my colleague Susie and I, what we want to be able to do is take this into staff meetings for entire staffs that weren't able to share that day with us and to go in and layer that deeper understanding and be able to take it that one step further so that it's just not one day on a shelf, that this becomes a tool that we can use over and over. I want you to think about why you're here today. You're here today because the Ministry of Education has put in some revisions in the Social Studies, History and Geography curriculum. The revisions are all connected to the Indigenous perspectives and they're very much connected to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. So Earlier this mind? year, the Ministry released the curriculum revisions for the grades 4 to 10 social studies and history curriculum and the day was organized so Teachers, educators, administrators would have the supports necessary to implement those changes into their classrooms beginning September 2018. We brought together one teacher from each school within the board and we wanted to be able to support staffs going back to their schools should they need it but also having the same opportunity to experience some of that content and the questioning, the resources and how to engage in the critical inquiry as well with those supports. We recognize here in Grand Deary that we needed to do a great deal more to support our educators in understanding that perspective from the North with an authentic voice. We're very particular about ensuring that we have authentic voice when we're sharing those stories and sharing of the histories. The presenters, they really brought the content to life and that was what was so important for us to capture that day so that we could share that content with more teachers. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to give you a crash course on basically Inuit history in Canada. Um, Inuit history and Canadian history, they're very intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Same with First Nations history, you know, it's a history of colonization, uh, this Canadian state that we live in right now. Kawisa Atiti, his specialty is bringing the Inuit perspective of history, culture, art, sport for cultural competency. So our worldview is almost similar to the seven grandfather teachings. It's all about harmony between you and other people, harmony between you and other groups, harmony between you, your environment and your animals, stewardship, taking care of your fellow man, it's all about working together. When you live in an extreme environment, you need every, every able-bodied person to be working. You need every able-bodied person to contribute, to succeed. It's life or death. So our rules to live by, they're called Inuit Kauye Mayatu Hangit. And please repeat that. <laughs> Don't let that 17 letter word scare you. <laughs> Inuit It's what Inuit have always known. One of the main things we talk about and as the Inuit of Ontario is cultural continuity. So important for our kids. Cult you know, success is, if you look at the research on suicide, Indigenous suicide, linking cultural continuity makes the students stronger, it helps create pride of who they are, and it makes them more successful. Like, there's studies that have shown that. Uh, we just did a research project called uh, Inuit, Inuit Student Wellbeing. What does that mean for the Inuit of Ontario? And our findings were very clear, cultural continuity. It could be language classes, bringing elders into the school. Don't be shy, I'm open to questions, discussion, I like that. Uh, there's, this is a safe space, now's your chance to ask. Kuisa is very engaging, he's very, he's very approachable, and there are no silly questions, and he's very open to that, and that's what our educators need. They need that open, safe space to take, take risks and chances, so it was really important to bring in someone that was respectable and engaging for our teachers to work with. I was born with an Eskimo number, Every Eskimo or Inuk in Canada, up until 1970, was registered uh, and assigned an Eskimo number on a little disc. 
So when Kawisa is talking about his Inuit number, it is his number and it is his story to share. Mine was E72529, because I was from South Baffin, um, which was designated Eskimo or East 7, and I was the 2529th registered Eskimo in South Baffin in 1968. They stopped that system in 1970, but continued to use it for many years after. If you went to the Hudson's Bay store to buy anything, you would sign in with your E7 so they could track you and government documents. If you applied for a health card, E72529. There was a lady about uh, six months ago who got a letter from Service Canada. She lives in Northern Quebec and it had her name and on the corner it had her E3167. So it's still in circulation. They say they, they don't use it, but it's within the records, right? It's within the system. When people say, Hawisa, can I call you something easier? Harvey, Harry, call me E72529. Spirit people live on. People live on. My name is Kawisa. I'm named after my uncle Kawisa, who died in 1960, eight years before I was born. So growing up as a little boy, all these elders would Kawisa, you know, treat me with utmost respect. And I'm like, why are they doing that? Because you're Kawisa. But what did I do? <laughs> I didn't do anything but I inherited his relationships. That's another thing about the naming system. You inherit the relationships that were made before you. The history is no longer history. It becomes current and it becomes our community awareness. That's what we really want to build into this. When we're looking at our revisions, we're building that awareness of where, of where we are in our relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous and Inuit and Métis people. We look at the history of this country of North America, of the world, if you would, um, what we're going to do with it. So we have to have accurate history. Delmore Jacobs is an elder that has worked with the Grand Erie Indigenous Ed staff for a number of years now, supporting teachers. He's a community resource. He's a bundle of knowledge that our teachers have come to rely on. You're teachers, very honorable profession. You're teaching the next mind to look at a peaceful way to resolve, okay? And we want to get on with the agenda, but I will open this up. There is, um, when we take things to action, which we're, we are called to action, I've always advocated for, yes, we learn about things, but we're gonna do something about it. What are we gonna do about it? And hopefully it's positive. I'm always saying, whatever you do, do good. There's enough evil out there, but do good, okay? So I really, I'm really glad to be here because when we look at land claims, Okay, which is um, a very key element in history. One of the things uh, when I did work in the land claims office, one of the biggest things we looked at was getting our own history back. So that one day this would be culminate and it'll go into the schools. So on Six Nations, we would at least get our history back. Okay, and then it could go out from there. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of that now. I hope to look at getting the history back to the point of this is what happened, and I'm always saying to people, don't take my word for it. Question everything. Question, question me, question everything. And then go out and do your own research and you'll find out, okay? And we'll all grow together. So that's why I look at coming here and I'm really glad to be a part of it. Dalmore and Kawisa, they bring those stories to life and it's that authenticity and it's the engagement with the educators where they can ask those questions about what's in the curriculum but they're getting the answers from a person who's lived it and shared it and experienced it and that's what's most important about having those voices there. They're telling their own personal experience and that makes it real for teachers and they get to see the importance of why we're sharing that perspective and why that curriculum revision needs to be there so that it becomes becomes part of our community awareness, not just a piece of curriculum or something that needs to be graded on a report card. So an inquiry question is an invitation to think. 
not to recall or summarize, but to think. The changes to the curriculum, um, most of them can be found in the examples and the sample questions. That's where the new content would be for a lot of teachers and I'm sure where many, many educators would be thinking that that's where their learning would lie and um, it you know, has the potential to be overwhelming. So what we proposed for them was that um, something that's already been in the curriculum and that's the inquiry model. It's intended to generate deeper thinking. And the thing to remember about an inquiry is that there's no definitive, often no definitive answer, often just leads to more questions. Delmar Jacobs um, inspired us to think that way because he said, ask questions, go out and gather information, ask me questions, and together we can go forward and learn together. So as teachers were wondering, how do we do this? It's a big responsibility. And so the model in the front matter of our social studies curriculum is the inquiry model. Just as Delmar said, ask questions. And so that it causes a repositioning for us. So rather than having the information and dispensing it to students and then, you know, asking for it back, we're alongside students, wondering together in a respectful way. One method that we found to be particularly effective is the use of photographs as a way of sparking inquiry. Who holds the power in that picture? It's a very interesting perspective. And um, I had that conversation in a grade seven, eight classroom. A lot of them were really questioning. And <clears throat> so this picture actually came to my mind and I said, oh, I have to show you this picture. I said, so where's the power in that picture? Where is that power? And I said, like the woman, to me, I look at that and I see, well, there's a lot of power in that picture. And so it's possible to um, show a photograph and ask questions, wonder about what might be happening in that photograph. There is another than a Eurocentric perspective to history. Indigenous Ed team is, is helping educators in providing um, accurate and authentic sources to inspire inquiry and to have us ask those types of questions. When they figured out, they said, well, why do we need to know that? Good question. Now, if you've got it, now how can you use that? They start seeing history holistically as opposed to uh, unitarily, right? And I think, I think if you look at it that way, it's, it's a much better way to go. From there, we can analyze and interpret and communicate that information um, to share knowledge among ourselves and, and with others. When we went to the ministry session in January, it was uh, a large component that we talked about was making sure that we have authentic sources, making sure that the things that we present to our students or with our students actually have that Indigenous voice uh, throughout them. There's that through line that is the Indigenous perspective. In a lot of what we've used previously, it's had that Eurocentric viewpoint, and we have to make sure that anything we're presenting actually has the authentic voice of the people that we're trying to communicate or trying to present their perspective. The resources that are in the school are all gathered in one place and so the teachers are able to use them, to, to access them easily. They know that they can use these resources with confidence that they've been supported by the Indigenous Ed team here in Grand Erie. When I'm working with teachers in curriculum, I'm able to say these are the resources that our Indigenous Ed team have. They're so open, they're so willing to share. And so it has opened up, opened up doors, opened up pathways for information sharing. All of us are on a very different journey throughout this term of reconciliation. So our teachers, our students, our staff, ourselves. And so it's really important that we're all partners in this journey. So relationships are the basis of what reconciliation is going to be. So we have to foster those positive relationships. The feedback that we received from teachers was overwhelmingly um, positive and what really struck them was that first-person perspective, the, the powerful narrative that our guest speakers were able to provide. And I think that everyone is very inspired and, and like myself came to a realization that there's so much more to know. 
In many ways, I feel like we're just beginning. I'm really looking forward to, to uh, continue our collaboration, building our relationship, continuing to uh, build relationships with community members, listen to their stories, and move forward.